Hi, and welcome to Ones and Twos, FP's economics podcast. Every week we take two data points. We use them to try to explain the world. I'm Cameron Abadi, FP's deputy editor with you here in Berlin, Germany. As always, Adam Tews, FP's economics columnist and Columbia University professor is with us in New York. Hi, Adam. Hi, Cam. So in the second half of the podcast, we'll be talking about sports betting. That actually is its own sort of timely subject with the NCAA tournament referred to as March Madness here in the U.S. starting next week. That usually is a an occasion for all sorts of betting that used to be illegal in offices, but I guess maybe now increasingly is legal. I saw that the Columbia University team did not qualify for the tournament, Adam, so apologies for that. But we will move on first, starting with the news data point. The news data point for this week is $130. That's uh, how much a barrel of oil has been selling for, more or less, as of this week. And it's a 40% increase in the last month, a 90% increase in the last year. Well, we've heard about $5 per gallon gas in some places, I think San Francisco and the Bay Area. Uh, That could become a reality. Today, I'm announcing the United States is targeting the main artery of Russia's economy. We're banning all imports of Russian oil and gas and energy. This oil price spike has all the trappings of the kind that can cause a recession. It's been really sharp and very sudden. But it's cost- the highest price for oil since 2008, which was during the global financial crisis. The trigger here, of course, is the war in Ukraine and more specifically the economic war that the West is now waging on the oil and gas producing Russia. Companies with investments in Russia have been rushing for the exits, including oil companies. And U.S. President Joe Biden just announced that America would immediately stop importing any fossil fuels from Russia. And reports are that Europe is considering doing the same. Uh, Sometimes we have to stretch a bit to make the news of the week into an economic subject, but not this time. I mean, anyone who relies on gas to get to work is noticing that gas prices are breaking record high prices. Anyone else will probably have noticed the increasing their heating or electricity bills. So Adam, to start, just how much more money is Russia making on net from these higher oil prices exactly? If the United States, as I mentioned, has stopped buying Russian fossil fuels, is Russia still making more profits than they were before the war? And what if Europe does the same? What if they stop buying oil? Okay, well, this is a, a, a quite tricky question to answer because the dust is, you know, really far from settled on how this market is going to work in future. But we take as a benchmark um, an estimate by Javier Blas, uh, Bloomberg's commodity specialist from late fe- February. Um, he estimated that uh, Russia was earning about $350 million a day in, in oil revenue. And at the time, the oil price was about $90 per barrel. And now we're up around 30, 130 between 120 and 130. So if you estimate, you know, a 30, a one third increase in prices, maybe somewhat more, then you could be figuring on daily revenues for Russia from oil exports, uh, 450 to 500 million, all else being equal. Now, America's sanctions against that are irrelevant, really. They're tiny. Um, that's part of, I think, what's enabled them. This is part of the, the game playing, the symbolism, the signaling. The UK is also imposing sanctions, and those two won't affect um, Russia very severely. Um, Europe is a completely different kettle of fish. So Europe takes 50% of Russia's oil, and Asia 42%. Um, so a European oil boycott would really hurt. You, you can reshuffle oil up to a point, um, but only up to a point, and it would cost the Russians. And then on top of that, you have to reckon with the fact that Ural's grade Russian oil, which is a mixture, a blend of heavier and lighter crudes, is already selling at a kind of reputational discount of um, as much as 20 percent or even more. So overall, I think despite the price increase, given the loss of markets, which could become very severe with the loss of a European market, were it to come to that and this discount, Russia's oil revenue is certainly not rising right now. I think it would be probably pretty safe to say that because the price increase is offset by these other factors. Though it's a fine balance and it would, you know, depends very much on the Europeans. 
All of that is, however, offset by what's happening on the gas side, which is normally the smaller of Russia's two energy exports. Blast had gas at about $200 million dollars a day versus 350 for oil. But the surge in gas prices in Europe has been so intense that we estimated um, that um, earlier this week and at the end of last week, Russia was earning over $720 million dollars a day from gas, which continues to flow through those pipelines. So it's quite possible that the surge in gas revenue driven by surging gas prices is offsetting anything that they're suffering on the oil side. Okay, so I mean, a lot of the attention has turned to increasing the supply of oil to try to drive down this price. And my understanding is that Saudi Arabia is really the only country with significant spare capacity to produce more of this crude oil in the short term, at least. And so what kind of factors into their decisions about whether to to cooperate here and, and produce more oil? I mean, what are the economic and political considerations that they that they might be weighing here? Yeah, in January, it was estimated that Saudi, UAE and Iraq between them had perhaps capacity for an extra 2.3 million barrels per day. Russia exports 5 million barrels per day into the market under normal circumstances. So that would notion at least cover about half of Russia's supply. But I think a lot of oil analysts think that those numbers were probably exaggerated. They think that because the main OPEC suppliers were falling short of meeting the quotas assigned to them. Right? If you get an OPEC production quota, there's really no reason not to not to meet it unless you have got various technological problems. Rigs are breaking down. The facilities aren't operating. You've underinvested for several years, which is what's happened because oil prices until recently, of course, were rock bottom. And in 2020, in COVID year, I mean, they went negative very briefly, right? So there hasn't been much incentive to invest. So that 2.3 million barrel per day figure may be a little optimistic. There's Iran, uh, which if it was to bring sanctioned capacity online, could probably add 1.3 million barrels per day. Um, but that's a hugely politically contentious move. Depends on finalizing the deal with Iran. Um, it would be contentious at home in the US with Israel. Uh, it would involve Russia, who's a party to the talks. And of course, it would really put up the hackles of the Saudis who, you know, are locked in this regional struggle with Iran for influence. And Saudi is the whale, you're right. I mean, Saudi is really the key to all of this. Um, and US-Saudi relations right now are precariously balanced, right? Um, MBS, the de facto ruler of Saudi, is on extremely poor terms with Joe Biden. The Saudis, you know, were very blatant, really, in supporting Trump. Um, this is a novel, novel development that the major Middle Eastern players take quite overt positions on the American elections, and they didn't get their way. Uh, Saudi is anxious to preserve the OPEC plus relationship with Russia, and I don't think would want to be seen as, as it were, helping the West out in an attack on Russia. And um, the future of this entire market depends critically not really on the West, but on Asia. And so far as China remains, broadly speaking, neutral, which is a win for the West because they could have gone the Russian way. But so long as they remain neutral, I think Saudi will think, you know, that that's probably the position to adopt themselves. China would probably want an increase in, in oil, but, but um, isn't going to exert undue pressure on on um, Saudi to, to help the West out. There are, um, these aren't great options, in, in other words, and how bad the options are, I think is made clear by the fact that, you know, there's talk of diplomatic contacts between Washington and, and Venezuela, which is really the last country in the world that you would need, you know, want to really be bringing online. But it's a huge story. I mean, in the heyday, uh, you know, Venezuela was a huge player in OPEC um, in, its, in its heyday. It used to be a major supplier to global markets, three million barrels a day. Big, big deal. But since, you know, the crisis in, in Venezuela of recent decades, they now they struggle to produce even 600,000 barrels. So that's, you know, a fifth of their former output. And if that could be boosted past a million barrels um, or more, that would make a, a difference. It's, it's a horrible prospect, to be honest, because of the type of oil. You know, Venezuelan oil is incredibly heavy, tarry stuff. It, it's actually only saleable on the market if you mix it with lighter crudes like the ones they swapped with Iran. So this is a disaster from a climate point of view, but um, it shows the straits that we're in. Got it. So this increase in oil prices, how exactly does it contribute to inflation, which has obviously also been on everyone's mind? I, I guess it does contribute to inflation. It's an increase in price, but is it just the kind of static 
effect of direct costs that consumers are paying for oil and gas? Or is there a kind of, is it really affecting the price of everything across the board? I mean, th through shipping costs, through energy costs, through all the other things that oil and gas do for us, is it kind of a more widespread effect of inflation? Yeah, this is the trillion dollar question that I think is going to increasingly come back to dominate the economic policy agenda. There are two basic logical problems which economists have been wrestling with ever since the first oil price shocks in the 70s. The first is, does an increase in oil prices lead to an overall increase in prices through cost effects? Or does it simply skew the price system, causing substitution and income effects on the other side? So a substitution effect would be the price of oil goes up, the price of cars goes down, because you know if you you, you want to drive less, if you if you have to pay more for for gas. Um, on the other hand, you could also have an effect which was more generic than that. The the price of of gas goes up for commuters, so they have less money in their budget at the end of the month. So they spend less money on restaurant meals or going to the cinema or going on holidays. That would produce a fall in prices. So in those cases, there's, a, there's an offsetting effect from the rise in the oil price. And the, the second question, the, the second logical question is, can a one-off increase in oil prices explain anything more than a one-off increase in prices? In, an increase in prices how could a one-off increase in oil prices lead to something cumulative, sustained price increases, which is what we call inflation? The situation in which both things would be true, in other words, you would see general price increases triggered by oil price increases and sustained price increases driven by a hike, would be one in which the central bank essentially accommodates the process, responds to the economic pressure by pumping more money into the economy. That's what we saw in the 1970s. So the central bank doesn't lean against, it leans into the cost pressure. And the, the big question of our current moment is, have we learned enough about how to do economic policy? Are the socio and economic pressures in modern societies so different from those half a century ago that we can avoid that kind of scenario. And central banks certainly you know, were talking about hiking interest rates. Um, and so that's a counter pressure, which would tend to contain this. The other thing to point to is, is that the society is just wired differently. In the 70s, when the oil price shock hit, we had very powerful trade unions, we had lots of condes, cost of living indexation in wages and pensions and so on. And, and none of that exists anymore in the same form. The trade unions are much, much weaker. And so, well, the, the money's, you know, the, the, the betting is still on. We don't really know how this is going to turn out. But that really is the experiment that we're running in the current moment. Can we, through monetary policy, contain this shock so that it doesn't become a permanent inflationary surge? Yeah, I imagine we'll be keeping our eyes on what Jerome Powell uh, does in the weeks ahead. And uh, yeah, that'll probably be a subject on the podcast. But um, to shift topics a little bit, I'm curious, what, what do high oil prices like this mean for climate change? I mean, are price shocks like this good for climate change politics? I mean, I guess high energy prices would lead to kind of behavioral changes. Maybe people will use energy less. That seems to have been the suggestion behind setting a carbon price, for example, or a carbon tax. Or on the other hand, are kind of high oil prices a problem? I mean, maybe because it leads to kind of panicked political responses. I'm seeing people talking about getting coal power plants back into operation. So I don't know, which way does the increased salience of energy cut here? Yeah, I, this is a really strategic question, particularly for Europe. I mean, I say that in part because I think the way this is going to play out in the US, unfortunately, looks pretty clear already. And the answer is that this is bad news for climate politics. Um, what, it'll, what it is forcing the Biden administration to do is to focus on the issue of how you secure cheap and abundant sources of energy for the American population. They've been quite explicit about their commitment to doing this. They don't put it in question. They don't say, folks, we're going to have to wean ourselves off this. They say, what can we do to ensure that you don't get squeezed? And that has involved even putting pressure on OPEC, including Russia, before the crisis exploded to increase production. So that's, I think, the way this is going to play out in the US. And, and there is indeed immediate talk right now of, you know, literally Washington pressuring Wall Street to release the pressure on Texas to increase fracking um, production. 
uh, which is which is the opposite direction of the way we need to go. And this ambiguity is built into the American situation because America's as a major energy producer and indeed increasingly an exporter, including of liquefied natural gas LNG to Europe. Where in Europe, on the other hand, I think that the entire balance of this argument runs the other way. So the Europeans are desperate. I mean, it's difficult to exaggerate the scale of this crisis there. I mean, the gas price in Europe last week spiked at the equivalent of $600 per barrel of oil. $600, right? So we are talking about an epic squeeze on energy prices there. And that feeds through into everyone's daily lives in a truly dramatic way. Um, so the Europeans are going to be looking for quick fixes too. They're going to be, you know, trying to build, you know, new terminals for LNG to bring in the American frack gas. They are indeed talking about switching back to coal if necessary. Even the German Greens are recognising the need to do that. But longer term in Europe, all of the incentives go the other way, right? So this is win, win, win now. I mean, A, it's good for the environment. B, it's a business proposition to go to make the energy transition. But C, above all else now, it's a way of breaking your dependence on Putin's regime, which at this point is critical for the Europeans. So I think all of the pressure is going to head that way. And if anything is going to kick Europeans into chasing all possible energy efficiency options, because that's really the best way to go here is not making more energy, but using what we do use more efficiently. This crisis surely will. I mean, $600 per barrel. Hmm the equivalent for gas prices. I mean, that's that's dramatic. Hmm. So finally, to just return to our conversation from a few weeks back about price controls, that was one of the subjects of a segment we had. And this got me wondering, I mean, when is some kind of central planning, whether it's in the form of direct price controls on oil or energy or some rationing of oil and gas, um, when would that be justified as a matter of, of fairness? I think concretely, if we end up with a gas boycott or a gas sanctioning regime between Europe and Russia, countries like Germany, Slovakia, Czechia, all of which are just enormously dependent on Russian gas, would have no option but to go to some sort of government overseen and government managed system that would no longer really represent a market. It would be, you know, it would be a matter of offsetting prices paid to secure the ga- necessary gas against what can reasonably be charged to customers, industrial and consumer. You would be talking about load shedding for industrial cons- customers on a large scale. Um, I think that's in the future, if that's the way we head. The only thing playing in our direction is that we're headed into the summer and so our overall demand will go down. But if we're still at economic war with Russia in the fall, then... I think there are concrete plans, say, in the German Economics and Environment Ministry to do precisely that in that eventuality. Um, Right now, the things which are coming into effect are various types of price cap, which are really to address energy poverty um, at the bottom of the social hierarchy. And that that makes perfect sense. And they're easy. They're readily available. Um, But full scale planning of supply and demand, that I think is really quite likely to come into effect if if, um, we end up you know, either unilaterally deciding from our side to shut off our consumption of Russian gas or conversely of the Russians do it to Europe. Well, great. That adds a potential element of drama into our podcast if next winter I'm doing it from an unheated apartment. Um, but Oh, they'll keep you warm, Cameron. It'll yeah. be industry that's shut off first. <laughs> they, you know, the, the situation where they ration domestic consumption, I think that's a that's an unlikely scenario. But, um, you know, the podcast is a kind of industry, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it was considered it was considered an essential industry, actually, during the pandemic. Um, media in general and podcasting uh, specifically. But anyway, okay, we will leave it there for now and come back to talk about sports betting. Okay. Welcome back. The next segment here will be about gambling. And the data point is $2 billion. That is the total volume of sports betting that took place in New York just in the first month that it became legal to do so this January. It's been a huge new source of tax revenue for the state and a new source of entertainment for all sorts of people. Like I said at the beginning of the podcast, March Madness is just around the corner and it's probably set to become even 
more popular as an object of of betting than it was before. So, Adam, I mean, I guess a, just a broad question to start. Gambling was just legalized in New York. It got me wondering when and why did it become illegal in, in the first place? So, broadly speaking, across the United States, it seems that it was the um, religious revival, so the great awakenings of the 19th century, these huge evangelical ways of enthusiasm that swept across the country. It was those that drove prohibition of gambling as a, as a vice. And then add to that sort of secular reform movements that were targeted of improving the living standards and the you know housekeeping habits of working class people that were particularly strong in the 1890s and included figures such as um, Teddy Roosevelt, who early in his career was police commissioner in New York. Um, all of that meant that by 1900, gambling was outlawed in New York and most other states of the union. Um, but in practice, it was always really a kind of regime of double standards, uh, almost schizophrenic at times. So there were a whole variety of, you know, more or less glamorous, more or less upscale um, speakeasies and private clubs where gambling still went on on a large scale. I mean, the most notorious instance of, prob of this is probably upstate in New York, where you've got Albany, you know, state capital, um, right next to Saratoga Springs, that makes its living off spas, luxury hotels and horse racing. And that means gambling. So it was a sort of typical kind of organized hypocrisy, if you like, um, around this issue of prohibition. Yeah, I mean, I always remark on, on how even there were office pools that were kind of yearly office pools across the country that were de facto illegal, but everyone knew they were happening. So, you know, I won't ask you if you've participated, Adam. Uh, I guess they used to be illegal. So so now governments are obviously earning a lot of tax revenue from gambling. I guess they're encouraging it partly for that reason. But does history suggest there's a tipping point somewhere, you know, where a state relying on a vice like gambling for revenues where that just starts to eat into the overall productivity that's the foundation of an economy yeah it's, it's quite the trade-off you're suggesting there like vice versus productivity uh, i mean my sense of i have very limited exposure to these places but data took me to reno and and uh we were just on a you know fly through and I mean, what really impressed me about it was just, you know, what a hard working place it was for exploiting our desires, right? They turn vice not into a distraction so much as to a form of production almost. You know, you're, you're pumping, you're pumped out. And certainly as far as Nevada, you know, is concerned, if it's anything to go by, in a big, relatively diversified economy like that, you don't get the sense that the gambling and economy displaces other things rather than that it acts as a kind of flywheel of regional economic development. It's a huge tourism industry of which, as it were, the gambling components only really a fraction. And it's the hotels and the wining and dining that, that really and the construction that goes into building these giant complexes which drive the local economy. The, the gaming industry in Nevada, of course, loudly trumpets its contribution and they say it's seventy billion dollars in revenue, and they they claim to contribute thirty seven percent of Nevada's tax revenue. And the payoff from that is that then Nevada's overall tax rates in other areas can be lower, which helps, as it were, to make the state an attractive location for business. The most extreme case I was able to think of was Macau, you know, the island uh, gambling economy, um, former Portuguese colony, isn't it? Um, and um, where something like 40% of GDP is not tax revenue, of GDP is accounted for by gambling. And the effect there is interesting, because what it does is it squeezes other activities. Um, it's in what used to be called Dutch disease, um, it, which was it's called that because Dutch economists noticed the way in which the oil and gas industry was displacing other elements of the Dutch economy in the 1970s, gas in particular. And you might call it in the Macau case, um, casino disease. So the huge revenue, revenue flows into the casinos drives up the price of accommodation for staff, um, the price of food, the price of transport, everything. And so the manufacturing sector, which Macau, like Hong Kong, used to have, you know, textiles like industry and things like that, is no longer commercially viable. Um, and so then you do get a displacement effect and a kind of trade off between the casino economy and the rest. Hmm. So to get more specifically into the bets that people make, I mean, when I sort of look into the gambling industry that, that it exists now, like it's sort of, I have trouble understanding the bets that people are making. I feel like I, I follow sports reasonably 
closely. But I, I mean, the half of the terminology, the terms that are going into the sorts of bets that people are wagering on, whether it's different kinds of leveraged and combined bets. I mean, I just have a trouble following and it got me wondering, yeah, the, what kind of math is going into designing these bets now? And and then just more broadly, if this is a huge industry, what kind of people are going into it? I mean, are, should we expect that it will attract highly qualified people from top schools, start going into this like, like they used to go onto Wall Street, sort of the quants of Wall Street now existing in the gambling companies? Yeah, there's, there's two types of expertise that go into um, the gambling industry. The more boring kind is the expertise that's applied to figuring out the odds for games like roulette or blackjack or whatever. And if you've got sufficient quantitative computing power, because the options there are predictable, right? It's like trying to design AI to play chess. You can, you can formalize it. And as long as your quantitative team is better than the people that you're playing against, and there's that famous instance when like a bunch of MIT maths, you know, and computer science math geeks got together and tried to break some of the Las Vegas casinos by simply outpowering them, you know, in terms of their numerical skills and their card counting skills. But that's, as it were, a relatively static kind of arms race between the casinos and the and the players. Sports betting, which is all in the headlines right now, is far, far more complex, subtle, and, and really interesting, in fact, right? Because A, because the events themselves are much less predictable than a roulette wheel, right? Which is basically ought, if it's properly set up, to be purely probabilistic. Um, and also because the positioning then in this higher uncertainty of the bookmakers and the people who run the sports books is much more tricky because they obviously want to take risks, but they don't want to be in the position of the gambler, right? They don't want to be as exposed as the gambler is because the gambler is taking a huge one-way bet, essentially. They can hedge in complicated ways, but they're basically, you know, gambling on a much larger scale, especially the big Sports books don't want to be exposed to huge losses if a team wins or loses unexpectedly. They want to profit, really, on the margin between those who bet one way and those who bet the other, right? Because they're going to take bets from both sides. And so what they do is, as it were, pr profit if they can call how many people are going to make the wrong bet. And how many people will make the wrong bet? In other words, put money on the team that it ends up losing as opposed to how many people make the right bet depends on the odds you offer. So it's really like game theory in the sense that my the best thing for me to do depends on what I think the punters out there will do in light of whatever odds I offer them. Right. So it's you're not really reading the game so much as the game plus what the punters think and how they think the game is going to go. And the people who do this are called line makers. And so they really have to be sensitive both to the underlying logic, the relative you know, performance of two sides, but also to the relative mood in the room, if you like, as to how this is going to go. Because what you really don't want to do is end up exploiting a huge mood shift, which you assume is going the wrong way, and then find yourself having to pay out hundreds of millions of dollars. So it's an incredibly tricky task. And the way in which they cope with this my daughter put a whole bunch of bets on on the Super Bowl because like, we were just, you know, it'd been advertised everywhere. We thought, hey, let's have a flutter. So we both opened accounts and she put some really smart, not all my bad bets went bad, but she had some really good bets. And as the game was progressively going her way, what was fascinating is that the sports book company tried to buy her bets back off her because they wanted to close out the position. They could see they were going to take a loss. They were worried they were going to get overwhelmed by the size of the loss. So if they could close out the loss at a slightly lower price, they were willing to, to take the hit. And so she actually traded several of her bets in before the end of the game, when there was still a chance it could go the other way, um, by, by exploiting this system. It's truly, it's really a much more active, dynamic market than simply the roulette reel model. Hmm. Congratulations, first of all, to, to your daughter. Oh, yeah. Uh, she really, she's way ahead. Like, she started on a career in uh, sports betting. So then I guess just to end up here, I was wondering, what, what are the most sizable fortunes that have been made via gambling exactly? I mean, has anyone become legitimately wealthy, like kind of, you know, billionaire style wealthy on a par with top entrepreneurs simply on the back of gambling? Are there gambling billionaires out there? In short, no. So um, 
a certain Billy Walters may be the most successful gambler, certainly sports gambler in history. He then turned into real estate, car dealerships and hotels. And he's estimated as being having a net worth maybe in excess of $200 million. So like a serious sports star, but not in the very top league. Um, certainly not in the top league of entrepreneurship. He's also serving a five-year sentence for inside trading. Uh, he may just have gotten out. Um, the big money is all on the other side. So running casino hotel complexes is where you can get seriously rich. And the most famous of all was Sheldon Adelson. He was worth 30 to $40 billion when he died in early 2021. Or Luke Chi uh, Wu, who, uh, along with Adelson, is a huge wheel in Macau, um, which is really the richest global gambling centre. He's maybe worth $15 billion pre-COVID. Steve Wynn, also, you know, legendary Las Vegas casino owner, is worth a few billion. And he started out uh, with his family a bingo parlour. Mm. So the way, to get, the way to get rich is to start with a bingo parlour, not start by playing the games. Okay, so that cliche of how the house always wins turns out to be true, in fact. Okay, then... Uh, we will leave it there. I wish your daughter continued luck. Uh, maybe he'll take some tips. <laughs> Thank you. If, uh, we'll if, report back. Exactly. On our, on our, or, or just yeah. send me some tips by email. Uh, <laughs> I don't some know. Tips. Actually, I actually looked into this. It's not legal here in Germany, so I can't get onto those apps. But, you know, anyway, we'll see what happens. Okay, that's it for another episode of Ones and Twos. Thanks, as always, to my co-host, Adam Twos. Listeners, as always, we like hearing your feedback. Please email us at podcasts at foreignpolicy.com or tweet us at ones and twos pod. Remember, that's twos as in Adam's name, T-O-O-Z-E. And of course, uh, remember to follow and review us uh, on your favorite podcast app. Ones and Twos is written and edited by me, Cameron Abadi, along with Adam Twos. It's produced by Laura rossbrow Tellum and Rob Sachs. Our social media manager is Claudia Tady. The executive editor of FP Podcast is Dan Efron. Thank you very much for listening, and we will see you back in your feed next week. Oh, we can put some on for you. We can put some exactly, on for you, exactly. What kind of cut do you take? What kind of? <laughs> what kind of? We can. We, we can. We can talk about it. Yeah.